Good evening, everybody. Mr. Harshpati Singhania, Ms. Preeta Reddy, Mr. Sunil Kant Punjal, Dr. Trihan, who I hope will be joining us very shortly. He's having some trouble with technology, and it's always the case uh, when we have something important happening. It's a pleasure to have you all with us today, and a very warm welcome to you all for a special session on India's health emergency and delivering vaccines to all Indians. Aima is pleased to partner Horasis as a co-organizer of the Horasis India meeting and delighted that we are able to host this special Aima session during the India meeting. For many years, this meeting has been held at exotic locations all over the world and all of us who have had a great time networking and interacting with people we know and also make many new friends over the conference weekend. But COVID has isolated and confined us. Thanks to vaccination, the world is slowly beginning to regain confidence in travel and in physical meetings. It was heartening to see crowds back at the Wimbledon and the Euro. Hopefully, we will be able to get together soon. India has responded to the shock of the April-May COVID spike by raising the rate of vaccinations and increasing the availability of the vaccine. The government's decision to increase orders for vaccines and permit vaccine imports should improve its supply and its decision to fully subsidize the vaccination of three-fourths of the population should encourage more people to avail of the free vaccine. The availability of more kinds of vaccines through multiple channels should speed up vaccination in India. However, with COVID variants dropping up, there may be still the need to follow up with the channels. We have an outstanding panel to discuss the challenge of vaccinating more than a billion Indians in a rush and building India's healthcare capacity to avoid the kind of situation that the country had faced during COVID's second wave. Now, there's a talk of a third wave, which is only adding to the anxiety. However, in the absence of therapies to cure COVID, mass vaccination is the only ticket out of lockdowns and self-imposed confinement. I'm pleased to int introduce a very distinguished panel to you today who will be debating this topic. Mr. Harshpati Singhania, welcome to the panel. You lead one of India's largest manufacturing groups and your business has experienced the healthcare crisis both in production and in the market. Many thanks for joining us today. Preeta, many thanks for agreeing to join the discussion. As the leader of the Apollo Hospitals Group, you have been at the center of the COVID storm all along. Your hospitals have been on the front line of treating COVID infections and administering vaccines. Thank you so much for sparing time. I know it's a very busy time for you and a very warm welcome to you. I hope Dr. Trihan will be able to join us uh, after he sorts out his technical issues. He is, of course, one of the best known cardiovascular and pancreatic surgeons and also the founder of a modern world-class healthcare chain. And now I welcome our moderator, Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal, who is well known to everybody. Mr. Munjal, always a pleasure to have you with us. As a leading entrepreneur and investor, you have been vocal about the need for rapid containment of COVID and the need for involving the private sector in expanding the reach of the vaccination program. Thank you for joining us. A very warm welcome to you. And with these words, let me hand over the session to Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rekha. And as we're all aware, uh, it is now well proven that the only real shield we have against the continuous battering that we have got from this pandemic is the vaccine. So rightfully, country after country is putting out ambitious targets in how quickly they will vaccinate their entire population, starting first with their adult population. India, too, had put out a target of 950 million people getting vaccinated by the end of this year. It is a very ambitious target, and it requires for us to, to be able to vaccinate 7 million people a day. Our current record is not quite quite at 7 million right now. At an average, I think we would be between 4.5 to 5 million or so. Uh, we have had better days. We've had worse days. But I think there is some work uh, for us to do, uh, both on the side of supply in terms of uh, ramping up the manufacturing capacity and capabilities, availability, and making it accessible to people, improving the information system. In, in effect, if you look at what the first wave and the second wave taught us, there were lessons for us there. There were lessons for us 
which showed us that we need to build a better rural healthcare infrastructure for one. Second, that the training is the key in this. How do you manage this right from the first stage? What do you do? And more importantly, what do you not do? You don't over medicate, don't you medicate where required. How do you isolate people? How do you trace them? How do you track them? So there are, there are a whole host of learnings that need to be transmitted in easily uh, digestible modules. So training has become the key and, and institutions like Preetas and a few others have done an amazing job, but still not enough of our scale, size, and diversity. We have to ramp this up. I think the third lesson was in technology. It is critical and imperative that we make active use of technology going forward uh, in, in equipping ourselves better. I think the fourth message was that the collective effort is transformative. No one of us by ourselves can do what needs to get done. We need to supplement each other's efforts and create a multiplier effect on this. And I think the last message that I would like to give to all of us ourselves is we need to make a permanent change in how we look at health and healthcare system for the nation and more particularly public health. So I'm going to stop here and, and uh, I had a few other I get the chance to go, but I'd rather listen to the experts here. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Preeta. After the second wave, lots of institutions in India yeah. said, add, we're going to add beds here. We are going to add beds there. Capacity is being enhanced. Um, oxygen capacity got enhanced. Uh, but is enough being done to train people to actually use this effectively? I have a call coming in from the race behind. I guess he's trying to log on. Preeta, while you answer, I'm going to take this. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I just want to know from a COVID perspective, uh, from you know within Apollo, which has about 15,000 beds, we went from zero to about 4,500 in terms of COVID bed capacity, and you know across the country, across the network. What helped here was the linking them up with technology. Uh, getting protocols which were best in class globally and being able to track so that the outcomes were on par anywhere in the world. So I think that really helped. From a skilling perspective, we realized that you know we just do not have enough skill manpower. Uh, there was fatigue in the se second wave, which also had to be dealt with. So online training, uh, you know, one of our entities is called Medvarsity. And the university quickly turned out programs which people could use the e-learning platform. And 200,000 uh, people throughout the country were trained on ventilation usage to become uh, vaccinators, to see that the protocols were common and they could have been shared. Uh, even something as simple as, you know, just, uh, just how do you deal with infection control. So we brought out what was called within our system, the Red Book. But we shared it widely with, you know, healthcare providers, which were not only part of the Apollo ecosystems, but there were small hospitals with, you know, 100 beds, 200 bed hospitals. So they had a ready-made handbook of systems, and that really helped from the, you know, from the shortfall in skilling, from the shortfall in not knowing what to do. So I think it was, it was a multi-pronged effort. In fact, the government picked up our, our, our e-learning. Uh, modules and platform, whether it was ventilator training or you know, multiple others. And then the government kind of used it, uh, which was a new thing, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra. So I think everyone came together to do what they had to do. And that, that has been a great learning. I'm going to, since you raised government, let me ask a harsh question on government. Since the government has been the main driver of the entire rollout of the response to COVID, do you, do you believe, uh, Harshan, you'll have to unmute yourself. Do you believe that the government could prioritize this a little bit differently from what they have done? Could larger, more crowded, busier, higher high risk areas, geographical areas get addressed first? Is that a possibility? Or is there any other method which be followed other than what we are currently doing to be more effective? So, Sunil, I think there were uh, huge learnings. Uh, particularly from the second wave, even from the first wave, but if the second wave in particular uh, for the government and also for everybody else. 
So one was how do you manage from basic things, you know, citizens wanted to know, for example, is there a bed available? When we face the, the issue of oxygen and medicines, uh, are those things available? And then there were certain portals and apps. I, I know in Delhi, I mean, we, we run a hospital as well in Delhi and uh, the government in Delhi had come out with a portal. Now, there were time lags and, it, and it's very difficult to put it together and have a perfect system. But I think a lot of learning along the way. One of the key things to my mind, uh, uh, the way we look at it in terms of government response is going to be close working between the central and state governments. Because as you know, initially central government was a repository of vaccines and they were giving it to states and then later on they decentralized it and that actually made things worse, quite frankly. So, and then the center took it back. So close working between center and states is one major understanding. The second is in terms of how vaccines are actually distributed. So at times, when there were issues around uh, seemingly non-availability of vaccines, it was often to do more with the, um, what should I say, unevenness of the distribution chain rather than the actual vaccine not being available. There were also, as Preeta said, a lot of learnings uh, from hospitals uh, as to how do you deal with, uh, with, with the inputs, how much should you keep in advance and what should you do. So that is one. Your specific uh, area, Sunil, in terms of saying what should the protocol be, etc. I think, look, we have already moved to a situation where government has said, and rightly so, that anybody who is 18 plus ought to be vaccinated. So I think the whole focus right now should be more in terms of seeing how many, as you said in your initial remarks, how can we accelerate that process? Because once open, everybody is vulnerable. Whether it's 18 or 45 or 60 plus or senior citizens, everybody is vulnerable. You're and right. as we say, or as they say world over, uh, you are not safe till everybody is safe. Correct. So, uh, so that, that's where I would, I would pause on this one. So the unevenness is still going on. By the way, there are still states right now which have faced run out or near run out of inventory uh, of vaccines. Whereas in some other states, we've had spillage because they were just lying around and not getting consumed. So clearly there is some work to do there. And, and I hope and wish that the private sector can play a more active role in supporting that initiative to creating higher efficiency, wherever feasible and practical. The, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the fringe of this, there is another funny thing that has happened. Since the government announced full free access to uh, uh, vaccines, what was being deployed in the private sector uh, didn't quite come to a complete halt, but it got completely squeezed. Even people who could afford it said, oh, I'm going to wait for the free one. I think we need to, to encourage people to go and pay, those who can, to pay and get, get this uh, used. I want to come back to you, Preeta, to a comment you made about health workers. I think that was very critical, very important that you have trained people, you have offered training protocols to others. Are all your teams, and you believe others in the healthcare system, now I'm not talking only about your hospitals, do you think they themselves are fully protected and vaccinated? Uh, easy off. So, Sunil, you know, within our system, we have this um, underlying rule that you have to gently mandate things. Uh, in the first run of the vaccine, there were a lot of the younger nurses who, because they were so frightened about the vaccination, and they really refused. Uh, so that's where a lot of communication and a lot of advice had to go into go into telling them that they need, need to vaccinate. So I think within our system, I would uh, very comfortably say that you know we're almost on 89 to 90 percent vaccinated. Why do we still have that 10 percent? Is you know sometimes they just go they, they're still on our roll, they haven't shown up. So I don't think we can ever reach 100 percent. But I'm quite confident that we've reached 90%, but it was a lot of hard work. I, I, I completely agree. What we did in our places, in all our offices, factories, workplaces, we actually said only somebody who is fully vaccinated can come in. So Don't, that's the entry mandate. So exactly. So we went and did that. Then we uh, suggested the same thing to our suppliers, to our distributors. So just kind of spreading the message. And we said, it's not just you. It's your families and those around you who also need to be vaccinated. Only then we would consider you fully vaccinated. Perfect. 
<laughs> so, Harsh, let me uh, uh, ask you a question about supplies of, of um, uh, the vaccine. Why do you think some of the manufacturers are finding it easier to ramp up capacity while the others are still struggling? Well, I think it can be done to, to ramp up where they are still behind. See, my understanding, Sunil, is this. One is that in the beginning, we only had really two manufacturers in India. Uh, the Serum Institute and we had uh, Bharat Biotech. Now, the Bharat Biotech had a limited capacity comparatively to begin with and, and Serum had the larger and they had capacity, etc. So, and now we have more people from the private sector who have come in. It's going. They, you have to start with a smaller capacity. So that's one part of the problem. The other issue I think which is innate in that is also the, see, you mentioned about spoiler as well in some states. Now, as we know, these vaccines are at a certain temperature and certain ambient conditions or, or non-ambient conditions, quite frankly, in which these have to be transported and moved. Now, if there isn't any predictability or certainty in terms of how the front end demand is going to come, it becomes very difficult to do planning. And I believe that that was one of the issues that did come up on a practical basis uh, when for, for the whole matter. Then we also had, as far as foreign vaccines are concerned, and Pita would know more about it, you would know more about it, there was this entire issue uh, about, uh, you know, first of all, the hesitancy in terms of importing it, and then once it was clear, some of the conditionalities along with that. So all that. So, so now I suppose as we speak today, we ought to be in a much better, or we are, I would say, in a much better place compared to what we were at that point in time. Uh, let's not also forget that the suddenness and the um, alarming rate at which wave two hit us also you know, rendered most parts of the system unprepared. So one thing that you made, Sunil, was that it's very important to sort of remember, document, learn from what we have learned. Because whichever way you, you talk about a possible wave three, uh, we, we shouldn't commit those, um, those errors uh, again. May I add one additional point, Sunil, to what you and Preeta were talking about earlier on in terms of vaccination. And I, I think um, private sector has a very important job in being able to help in this whole process. So, for example, like you mentioned, uh, both of you mentioned, in our group also, across JK organization, we've had uh, right now, I suppose, it's about 75% plus of all our employees. And I mean workers down right, right to the workman level who have been vaccinated. And if you look at a double shot coverage, I think there's about 23 or 24% who've, who've been covered. Now, one of the other reasons, by the way, as you know, is that if contractually, um, regulatorily, if you had COVID, you've got to wait for perhaps three months before you can, you're eligible for a vaccine. So some people who have been left out, perhaps as Pita was saying, could also be uh, a result of that. Yeah. But there's an interesting silver lining to all this. And, and you're right in saying this is a surprise. Of course, the whole, uh, the whole attack on, on humanity was a surprise in some sense. Yeah. But what people did, it shows such an amazing entrepreneurial spirit. There are 104 uh, COVID-19 vaccine candidates currently undergoing clinical trials and 184 at preclinical development at this stage. Never before in history has the medical system, the pharmaceutical system, the, uh, uh, the entire research and manufacturing system responded with this speed and alacrity. Of course, many of these were candidates which were not purpose built for this because this was not known. They were modified from other uses or midway to, to using, uh, making something else. That demonstrates to us that we can actually do a lot more than we imagine we can. If we are a bit more innovative, if we are a bit more thoughtful and we actually apply ourselves, we have been able to do that. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves, Preeta, is why are we finding things like gender disparity even in vaccination? Why do you think this is happening? Yeah. So if you take uh, 
within the honor system or any healthcare system, you won't find gender disparity. I, I would certainly not hope not. So most of our you know, first our time ladies leading this. Yeah. yeah. But thirty eight percent of Indian women, for instance, own a smartphone mm -hmm. as against much more of the male population. So I think there itself there's there's a reason why I think you just find you know more men uh, coming. Also, it's in the rural areas. So communication mandating uh, focus in the rural areas is still there's a long road ahead, and that's why you're seeing that dichotomy and that percentage. And 65% of Indian Indian population is in the rural area, so that's where you see this this large gap. And the fact remains that you know uh, we still haven't taken vaccination to people's homes. Uh, they still have to come to a center. So the the women are still not as mobile as they should be. So unless we take vaccination to uh, where people live, to people's homes, maybe to the you know the economically weaker section, uh, we're not going to be able to get you know to get that gap bridge. And to do that, these are certain steps, which is communication, which is logistics to take the vaccination where it has to go, which again has give them access to smartphones if you can, and more than anything else, we will India. Yeah. So I think these were the reasons why I was seeing that they are gender disparity. Yeah, absolutely. And and in countries like the U.S., you can walk into any pharmacy and anyone can can get vaccination. You don't even need to be pre-registered or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. so clearly we are we are some distance away from getting there. But what do you think, Rita, that private sector can actually do to help the entire system move forward uh, quantum leap from where we are? So I, I really think that you know private sector has to do much more than what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say, for example, I'm using you know my organization because I'm just working here day, day in and day out. We've done more than 2.1 million people. So if one organization can do that, uh, the private sector altogether can do 100 times more. Yep. You know, so we should be able to do that. We strengthened our cold chain supply so that you know the delivery is seamless. Uh, can we have better delivery systems? Whole chain supplies, work with other agencies. I think we need to do that, which is also important. Again, vaccine infrastructure, you know, while uh, networks have their infrastructure, it's still not uh, available in, let's say, our pharmacy chain, for example. Uh, you can't really do it because we haven't had permissions to do that, you know, so those permissions have to come. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, there the NGOs, uh, there's the road tree. Everybody wants to uh, take vaccinations in large vehicles, uh, in a truck, park it there, finish it, come out. But still, permissions are hard. So on one side, you've got vaccine vaccine spoilage. On the other side, you don't have permission to really go and deliver vaccines. So I think that's where there's a huge paradox or there's a gap and that gap needs to be bridged and uh, while we're trying as one organization i think everybody needs to work really hard on that so let me expand that question for you harsh what do you think are the roles that both government and the private sector need to play in removing the current gaps in the healthcare system in the overall healthcare system in india and more particularly in the healthcare delivery system so let me let me first um, preface um, something else before I actually respond to your question. If I put it very simply, mm -hmm. from a private sector perspective or even from our entire economy perspective, uh, we know the, the impact COVID has had on the economy. I mean, even if we grow at, at higher rates, we would have essentially been two years behind. I mean, give more or less over with the math. Uh, lots of people have lost jobs, which are running into millions in numbers, right? So, and from the private sector also, it will work only if there's demand. Whether you talk manufacturing, whether you talk services and everything. So, frankly, that is the preface I wanted to give in terms of saying that it is in the self-interest of the private sector and, and the, whole, the whole country for that matter uh, to see that we are able to do this um, you know, as quickly as we can. Now, 
in addition to what Uta and you have also talked about in terms of the private sector, see one part is to to propagate the fact that this is essential, and private sector also has a lot of reach to rural areas because you sell in rural areas, you have manufacturing units in rural areas, you have supply chains. So across the chain, the private sector can sort of advocate that vaccination is important, vital and good for you and try and remove some of that health and see that because that is coming from the mindset issue. Number two, private sector's outreach to the communities beyond their own workplaces. And today the government has allowed ESR spending, for example, to be used for, for this, right? So it's not a matter of, you know, how much money will be spent. Uh, so that is available. So the entire concentric circle is being widened. The third is, uh, as, uh, as Preeta suggested, that can we in the private sector also propagate technology usage in sending this down into deep rural areas. So for example, can suppose there is a particular area where we have some, some beachhead, some organization. From there, can we link to um, other hospitals, other people uh, who are at some other towns? And also then the supply chain uh, and infrastructure in terms of saying, okay, can the private sector get, get vehicles? to actually physically get those vaccines down to those particular areas. Now, the one key point is working closely with the local administration in the government. And our own experience has been that actually it is the DN, the district magistrate, who is the key person. And they also, frankly, have a job to do. So they are, they are also very keen that in their uh, sort of areas, there is a maximum, you know, fastest rollout. So the private sector needs to work very closely with them. It doesn't need to get to us, you know, the top person at the state or at, you know, or, or even in the center. You really need to do a very tight working with the local administration. See what their needs are. Where, where do they want uh, more uh, more vaccination to be done based on statistics? And we take we we move forward with that. Since you spoke of the economy. Let me just, just step uh, aside a little bit. Uh, it is well known that small industry, cottage industry has borne the brunt of, of the slowdown. Of course, barring some large companies in specific industries like travel, hospitality, etc. Uh, by and large, it's been small and mid size. We have often said that in two years, India will get back to some kind of normal where it was two years earlier. Do you believe that is true also for small industry? Absolutely. You know, um, Sunil, you have hit the, you hit a very important point. See, statistically speaking, uh, India's per capita real private final consumption has come down to a level that it was three years ago. And there are various estimates, but there has been one estimate which says that almost 2.27 crore jobs have been lost in the, in the second wave. Now, these are frightening numbers and it's, it's particularly so in a country where we want to produce, you know, a million jobs a month, etc, 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 to add to that. And one of the things that I, I would believe, and you would know as well as Sunil being involved with various chambers and other associations, that the data we get is largely from the formal, organized, larger sector, call it whatever you will. So actually, it's also difficult to estimate the real impact, both in terms of jobs, as well as on an economic front, in terms of, you know, rupees, uh, lakhs or whatever it is in the economy, which have been impacted because of stuff that has happened at the small and medium scale enterprises. Forget, <clears throat> forget the informal sector, forget the daily wage earner, the shopkeeper, who would run a tea stall every day and you know <clears throat> or, or, or or somebody like that so really the impact is very large and it is also therefore in the interest of the larger sector to link with its suppliers which very often are the medium and small scale enterprises because if they don't function the large industry is also going to be hamstrung 
it may not show up today but it's going to show up tomorrow yeah absolutely so um, uh, thank you that that was very well uh, enumerated so uh, first a uh, message from narendra trihan he's trying desperately not able to log on he's tried from an ipad he's tried from a laptop doesn't work so i've just told him to take it easy if you can pop in because we have only 30 minutes left to go if not then we have to our shining teachers here who will hold the floor as as they are doing right now so um preeta we have often said that this is a sector ripe for growth but as in anything else in life the big jumps big leap forward come with innovation and world over we recognize a lot of the innovation is coming from startups uh from clearly from not from the giant organizations uh of course many of the startups get acquired by by the big organizations but the, the culture of encouraging innovation encouraging failure uh, uh, uh telling people to carry on an experiment uh, whether it works or not uh india has developed this as a new culture we are the second largest startup nation in the world but for some reason uh on the health front on the health devices medical devices healthcare health research we are still behind even within the startup uh, uh, universe why do you think that's the case and do you think anything needs to be done to change that so sunil uh, you know this is a area which i think all of us are excited about and we'd like to focus for because we know that once we get it right in india just like pharma did you can uh, be an answer for the rest of the world and i and i think it's not too far away uh, some of the things which you know we've also just like you with the trying to see can we invest into startups can we look at medical devices what i see is that this whole uh, you know the the root of the permissions you know the regulations uh, it's a bit hard you know you need to know the right person in icmr you need to push it through this um, csir you know all these multiple bodies which are there the permission seem to be like a big challenge then access to capital by you know people fund and um, there's a uh, private equity or there there all these uh, the cost of literally going to a bank is still much higher than let's say you had a startup in california they would get uh, bank and funding at, at much cheaper rates and the returns would be much higher so i think if that if we could find an answer for that we will see the sector flourish but having said that healthcare startup i think we've seen like a, a huge number coming up uh will some of them become you know unicorns uh, i'm hoping they will because they mm-hmm. should uh also data protection again is you know it's a big point we have to be very cognizant and very careful of that uh that a lot of the multinationals want to fund or want to jump into india or want to be part of you know ecosystems like ours where we're really touching millions of lives and then this big question comes comes about that how do you access or where do you own the data where does it sit and i think the right answers uh, to that make it much more you know uh, useful and important because that will also answer some of the this whole uh, startup system so the startups are two kinds there's one which is really piggybacking on all the data which is you know so called available and there's another one which is actually providing care to a patient so i think both these have to be thought through uh, really well and supported absolutely i couldn't agree with you more only i have a slight difference with you one we can't just say that there is a problem we have to go back to the government and give them note after note after note tell them what needs to change second risk funding is now available in india you don't have to go to banks for this money and you should not go to banks and you're right indian bank money is too expensive on a relative basis even in real terms it is expensive money so this has to be risk capital coming from venture funds angel networks and the like and for larger entities from private equity funds uh, and that is something that we all have to encourage the biggest shift i have seen is private offices private wealth managers and family offices shifting to invest in this area and i think that is is the most impactful change that has taken place 
in recent times. And if they see uh, an opportunity here, both to do the right thing and to do good and be good, I think that that is an, a unique opportunity to invest in an area where there is real return and at the same time massive public good. So it is a true win-win-win for all concerned. And so you know that space well. So you know, I'm glad you're saying it because it's a great advice. No, no, and, and I, I, I strongly feel that that's an area which needs to be encouraged, and and it can only benefit uh, the entire nation uh, in so many ways. Rita, maybe Sunil is letting out some of his own secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I, I'm in India right now. Um, uh, so I, I'm before we actually wind up now because uh, Dr. Trihan has sent a message again. Uh, he's still trying, uh, having still having trouble logging on. He, he's no, I, so so in that case we shall. I thought in case he's able to, we might extend a little bit. But since he's not, we then have. Uh, six and minutes and a bit uh, available to us. Uh, instead of my asking a question, would uh, e any of you have a question of the other one or a comment you'd like to make before we wind up? So, um, you know, um, I think one thing I'd like to say we've all talked about is that there is a need for much closer working uh, between private sector, government, and also, Frank, and, and of course, the medical community, but also the citizens at large. Because at the end of the day, we must remember that we still, as individuals, as citizens, have to be uh, responsible. So, you know, what was disturbing is when you see everybody went through a very harrowing experience uh, in, in, in COVID-2, uh, wave 2. And, uh, you know, almost everybody that I know uh, was impacted directly or indirectly. They've either lost somebody or people they have know very well have suffered. But when the government starts removing the lockdown, which we all have been asking for, by the way, you suddenly see these throngs of people. So there's nothing wrong with the throngs of people. What is wrong is that they are without masks. There is no semblance of social distancing. And, you know, we've all been witness to this. So I think I'd like to use this platform to also say that we, each of us, need to behave responsibly. You know, I have started going to office, let us say, and I'm going five days a week. But when there is somebody in the room, I wear a mask, even though I am double vaccinated and perhaps the other person as well. So this is one thing that I think we need to do as a nation uh, to do this. Otherwise, all efforts would come to naught. The second quick point I want to make is we didn't talk about it as much on this program. It is about the econ economic sides of it. We touched upon it. It is very essential that given our population, given our, our masses, we need to have specific programs. And the government is doing that. I'm not saying they're not. The food, the food that they have put out, etc. But we need to do even more um, uh, in terms of trying to bring back these jobs, trying to bring back sectors. We don't have time to talk about the specifics here. But that is the other important message that I think we need to reference. I will try and come back at this time after Preeta's comment, because uh, the question would be about whether monetary or fiscal tools of the government are more effective and and what do they have in their watches that they can use more of now. Uh, Preeta, over to you. But Sunil, I just wanted to highlight, uh, you know, one of the programs which we managed to do uh, in the Nilgiris. Nilgiris is a district of uh, Tamil Nadu, and they have done 82% of the tribal population. And it's not as if, you know, we have a hospital in Nilgiris, but what was done is there's a fantastic collective. There happens to be a lady, but that's okay. And uh, having said that, you know, uh, working together, they first convinced the tribal leaders to take the first jab because, you know, there are a lot of tribes there and they could lead by example. And then the NGOs were on board to come and help with the vaccination. Uh, private sector came, you know, the, the government wasn't supplying fast enough and private sector kind of stepped in. But to me, that's a success story. And the same thing happened, uh, you know, in the district where we come from in Andhra Pradesh. We do a program called Total Health. 
and we respond and it's part of our CSR, but you know, 200,000 people come under the two hundred thousand people come under the Oh, looks like we got Dr. Trehan finally. Yeah, so I'm saying that because, you know, these things are possible. And vaccine hesitancy is directly proportional to economic recovery and yeah. uh, adopting these uh, safety norms. So unless we get that vaccination, vaccine hesitancy, uh, and then for a little while maybe be tough on it, we are still heading for a problem. So I think we need to figure that piece out. Yep. Hello. So, good to see Dr. Trehan here. Welcome, Doctor. Hi, Doc. Yes. How are you? Hi. Good to see you. Very Thank you for joining me. So, uh, if it is okay, Rekha, we will extend the session by a little bit since Doc has joined. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, I think that. Frank has already given us permission to do that. So, Great. go ahead. Welcome, Dr. Trehan. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Dr. Trehan, I, and I guess all of us have got so used to doing these programs that we now uh, we stop preparing or, or log in early for these, as most organizers ask us. And we do have sometimes these challenges at the last minute. Yeah, so, this, uh, is, this is the first time it's happened like this. But anyway, you learn. Yep. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, Doc, tell me, the second wave seems to have a fat tail uh, still going on in places like Kerala and Maharashtra, why it's kind of tapered off in most of the parts of the city, uh, most of the part of the, uh, of the country. We even talked of uh, um, probably uh, an explosive situation in Uttarakhand because of the um, Kumbh Mela which took place. But fortunately, while there were many infections, but not the kind of number in Uttarakhand itself. So what do you think is going on? Is there any learning for us here for future? See, uh, Sunil, to tell you the truth, we all get on the TV and programs like this and act like we know it all. The truth is that nobody really knows. This is one of those viruses which is very unpredictable and has not followed any pattern that we have, we have predicted. The point is, when does mutation happen? Mutation happens when people get infected and the virus is replicating itself inside the body. It spins a certain uh, variant depending on what it is uh, sensing as a danger or something like that. Okay. We don't know the exact mechanism, but that's the difference. So the point then comes up that will we have enough infect people infected? They, it has a life of its own and it will keep multiplying as we go along. Okay. So now, if you look at it historically, what happened in the Spanish flu pandemic? <laughs> there were waves. There were there was a big wave. Then there were smaller, a couple of waves. And suddenly, two years later, it disappeared. <laughs> Can we hope for something like that? We don't know. But the point is, today it is still following the same pattern as the Spanish flu, because the distance or a gap between the first and second wave was 32 weeks. And in yeah. India, it's 32. Okay. Correct. Also, yeah. the second wave was much higher, although I don't think it was four times higher like it happened in India. But then we helped the wave to move along by doing all our things that we did. Okay. <coughs> now you, you're asking me this question about the fat tail. So, Kerala is perplexing to everybody in the sense that they have vaccinated a lot. They have, uh, because a small scatter of population, they have uh, been under pressure to contain it and still the numbers keep rising. Now, also we know that there are the new variants that they have found from there may be the cause behind all this and that the RO factor is so high that these people can, are not, I mean, they're it's just going through the full population right now. That's what it seems like. Now, the, this is a race. This is a race between our ability to vaccinate and the virus to mutate. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what is encouraging? One is that the latest ICMR zero survey says that there may be 60% zero positivity in the country. If that's the case, we have hope that even if we reach 60% of vaccination, I mean, actually, we're saying more than that. So now what it means is there is a there is a model model about the number of vaccines we can do per day. So it says this 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 model is called Shakti, 
I mean, you could pick any model. Some of them, most of them are not 100 percent accurate. But it says that if 50, if we can do 50 lakh vaccinations a day, then we have a possibility of whatever the wave is going to be, we blunt it by 25 plus percent. And if we can get to 70 lakhs a day, it will be even more. Or maybe 90, it will, it will disappear. But that's not happening. But we can surely aim for 70. Now, I was talking to somebody last night who's the, I mean, the horse's mouth. And he said that, look, August, we should be able to get between 12 and 14 crores. That means we can reach 70, close to 60, 70 a day. That is what we really need to. So if August happens 14, 15, we expect 17, 18 in the following month. And that's when it will go from 50 to 70. But the good part is that we have between the government services and, our, and the private sector, we do have enough capacity to go up, up to one crore a day. So ultimately, the, the key lies in how much we can vaccinate because it's already proven that people who have been vaccinated, no matter where they are, even in Kerala, that it is a mild form rather than getting into the hospital. We have to struggle with. <clears throat> Yeah, that's been seen. Uh, uh, data has shown that in the US, in the UK, in India, and multiple other countries, that of the people uh, who are severely uh, getting infected in recent times, 95% of those who have not been vaccinated. And of the mortality, only 0.01% is those who had vaccin been vaccinated. So the vaccination so far is proving itself to be effective. That's for sure. So I have a question for both Peter and you. Do you therefore think we should accelerate the process of going down age because the young kids will go out as, as the restrictions are eased off. They will go out more, schools will open. Should we go down to 12 years? Should we go down to 6 years? Uh, when do you think it should happen and why? Preeta, you want to take that? I think uh, Dr. Preham, because clinically, you know, is it safe for children? Uh, there's still that worry among the parents, so I think... No, this is assuming, uh, assuming, Anapita, uh, you can't give it uh, unless it's safe, okay? This is presuming all trials have been done and it's approved. Okay? I'm, I'm just talking about <laughs> I think 100% needs to be done, Sunil, because I think they're the ones who are right now the most vulnerable to getting infected. So I think that is what needs to be done. And uh, that lot needs to be targeted and it has to be given. Uh, efficacy, of course, safety, of course. But I think global data showing that it's safe enough. And uh, children getting uh, infected is definitely there. In fact, I had a problem in my own home. Uh, my my baby granddaughter had uh, was COVID positive. She's only six months old. So I think the worry and the concern is there. So I think the sooner we get it done, uh, the better. Yeah. So, Doc? So, you know, the, the, the thing to add on to that is that in the last wave, the second wave, where lots of children did get infected and there is a lot of zero positivity in children, that means that they were either asymptomatic or they were minimally asymptomatic and we did not see much. But you did see in the post-COVID series what, what is called the multi-organ inflammatory syndrome. <clears throat> that was seen, but fortunately it responded very well to immunoglobulin therapy. So what we are thinking today, and you know, this is part of the discussions in the in, that we are having in the NTF, the National Task Force of Supreme Court, is to say that like we got caught without enough or we did not have enough pharmaceuticals available when we wanted them for different stages, that we should be better prepared in case the third wave actually is significant, that we should have all the supplies available. So that's the concentration like right now with the pharmaceutical world that we could have enough immune globulin, we might have enough uh, of uh, amphotericine and remdesivir and tocizumab. Those are the four uh, and dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is the easiest to manufacture. There are enough manufacturers in there and they are ramping up. But the remdesivir also is now, I don't think, will be a problem. Tosi is still maybe. But you know, there is, a, there is a gut feeling also along with all the data that comes in. That feeling is that I don't expect, or we collectively don't expect, 
that the third wave is going to be as devastating as the second wave. So that means if we survive the second wave, we should be okay for the third wave by way of, of capacities, by way of therapeutics, by, by way of knowledge, and by way of physicians available to treat them at different levels. So I think we can be prepared. Now the question is when will it going to happen? And one of the things that we really need to look at is that early sensing, containment in that particular region wherever this, this thing happens, and isolating it like the Bhilwara uh, model that we keep talking about where, where one DC in Bhilwara seals up the district and the numbers came down crashing and they still they, they never had that kind of uh, that infection rate even now. So the point basically is if we are proactive in sensing the, the emergence of a virus or a variant and coupled with a strong administration that will take quick action, we can contain it even if third wave comes. And if we can contain it, we can still continue with our normal or quasi novel lives and, and, and economic activity so that it doesn't become devastating for our country. So uh, there has been, of course, speculation that children will get infected and infected much more this time. Part of it for obvious reasons, because they're not being vaccinated. Uh, the adult population is. Uh, do you believe we are equipped well enough if it does actually impact children more? Is our system equipped well enough? So if I read your question right... The basic thing is, one, the reason why we are saying children, and, and you have alluded to it, that a large proportion of the adult population will, because they are vaccinated, will not be the, be the host for the virus, and the virus is going to look for hosts which are unprotected and that's the children. That's the theory behind it. There is wide ranging view on it, whether it will happen or not. But the point is, where are the super standards for children? Super spreader for children are only two, schools and sports events. Otherwise, it's controlled between. Now, the children are suffering, no question. It's going to be all two years by the end of this year that they have been isolated. And the fact is that they, it takes a toll because interaction at that age, like any other age, but more so at that age, is a very important ingredient of, of growing up. So, so that's why we are seeing too many children becoming isolationist and getting into their own uh, video screens and reading and all that, you know, not losing interest. Now that has to come to an end, but I think that now sitting in July, we should not get impatient. Maybe another two, three months to six months is the maximum. I think we'll have to isolate the children. As the vaccination program rolls out, we should be able to return and, and colleges and all that as OSAPs. So I think that very important when we talk about life versus livelihood, I think children life applies, not life care. At the other end of the spectrum where the working forces you need to get them healthy and running and protected. That's what our, our concentration is right now. But when the vaccine arrives for children, we have the capacity to roll it out very fast, but it depends on the production capacity. So now co-vaccine is the new hope for children. And uh, and there, there is a lot of uh, uh, sort of optimism about its appearance soon. And if that happens, we can we can roll out. I mean, don't forget, the, it will only be first from 12 to 18. And the yep. population to be vaccinated in 12 to 18 is relatively, I mean, as compared to the rest of the country, or adult population is relatively small. So we should be able to roll it out very quickly. More than population of many countries. So yes, yes that's true. And, that's and, and I think that country, anything we do, anything we do, stami, stami, because of that, no question. Exactly. And, so and, US, and uh, US, is, US is experiencing for the first time a drop in population of one point one. So I don't know what will happen in India. But I, I, I hope not that this is not the modality of birth control or population control. <laughs> so, Harsh, let me ask you the last question. What do you think will be behavioral change that has taken place during COVID 
which will remain permanent okay that's a very important question i'll tell you medicine will see a whole new shift of things to come and we have prita here uh, uh, told us also very very I'd like each of the three of you to take a stab at this question after, after doc finishes then then harsh and yeah. prita no, no, no. so one of course it is to the benefit of the patient more than anybody else that the normal cycle used to be the patient would come travel 3 4 5 700 kilometers to get a first consultation with the doctor then learn what they need and then go back and come back and today 70% who don't need to come to the hospital or a doctor's office don't need to come and we can treat them quite successfully or at least give them good advice or give them supplementary advice to their local physician the thing is that once who are who need to come to the hospital are already prepared for their coming for it is it is cost saving human resource saving they can plan their whole life properly so side benefits are you now of course then if you, you will take the platform you don't have you don't you don't need a specialist in every icu yeah and also the future oh. so many many things like that will happen and i'll i'll stop here so we can add on uh her knowledge is much more about it prita no no i think point of care has shifted uh before you know we were almost like an edifice you know hospitals were uh, were temples and everybody would come to worship at that temple and at that altar and that has changed and now i think the point of care the most important the center of focus now has become the person who needs it you know you call it customer you know, we call it the patient so that there's a huge shift in that direction so everything we do and design has to now be around the customer and that's why you see that you know the whole digital ecosystem has become so important as against an infrastructural ecosystem and that's changed uh, diagnostics have changed point of care has shifted and you have quicker faster turnaround times you know you can do a whole panel with just a drop of blood and then that's going to happen so i think these things have changed and then the devices you know you can monitor so many things with a device so and people because of that have become so much more conscious